So hello, and welcome to the Human Rights Research and Education Center's webinar on transitional justice in the Arab Spring. I'm Kirsten Fisher, and I'm very pleased to be able to introduce this panel of speakers, academics and practitioners who are doing really interesting work on issues of transitional justice in the uh, Middle East and North African region. Now, this panel corresponds to a number of chapters that will be included in a forthcoming book, a book by the same name, Transitional Justice in the Arab Spring, that will be published by Routledge uh, next year in their Transitional Justice series. That's in 2013. Since December 2010, the Arab world has experienced a revolutionary wave of demonstrations and protests that have upset authoritarian governments, ushered in democracy in some countries, uh, and forced the world into both excited but also apprehensive attentiveness to see what happens next in this region. In some countries, such as Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, and Yemen, the former regimes have been overthrown, and the countries are now in uh, processes of reconstituting themselves. Civil uprising has also erupted in Bahrain, and Syria is now in a full-blown civil war, uh, the outcome of which is uh, fairly uncertain at this point. And other countries in the region, such as Morocco, uh, have also seen their own more minor protests for change. This revolutionary surge has been labeled the Arab Spring, denoting uh, this pressure from below of these democratic movements, but also symbolizing the new beginnings of springtime and the end to a harsh, dark wintertime. It also symbolizes the philosophical and political concepts of enlightenment and awakening. But overthrowing authoritarian regimes is only a first step to realizing peace and justice and respect for human rights. In addition to providing citizens with the opportunity to gain voices and usher in democracy, the Arab Spring has also provided opportunity to these countries and their citizens to examine and to address histories of oppression and mass human rights violations. So this panel and the book uh, focus on examining transitional justice, this addressing and dealing with the legacy of significant human rights violations as it pertains to the Middle East and North Africa region. And they also focus on considering transition justice through an Arab lens, looking at distinctive concerns and problems and unique perspectives concerning realizing peace, justice, and human rights in the region. So at this point, I'm going to introduce our speakers. Uh, I won't be able to do justice to their impressive biographies in my really quick introductions. Uh, but in the interest of time, I'll keep things simple. And you can look on the website for full biographies of our speakers. Um, we're going to begin with Habib Nassar, who's the former director of the MENA program at the International Center for Transitional Justice, and who has just uh, joined the Public Interest Law Network as the Middle East and North Africa director. We'll then invite uh, Mark Kirsten to speak. He's a PhD candidate in international relations at the London School of Economics. And he will offer insights into the politics of uh, transitional criminal justice as it relates to Libya and the International Criminal Court. Michael Wahid Hanna a fellow and program officer at the Century Foundation in New York, will talk to us about transitional justice in Egypt. And finally, Elham Mania, an associate professor of political science at the University of Zurich, will talk about the type of obstacles that face women in the Arab MENA region. And, and I would like particularly, I mean, in uh, my short presentation to address two questions. The question of transition and justice as a participatory process and, and who are the actors currently involved in these processes in, in the region, uh, uh, but also the question of uh, social and economic rights, but more generally social and, and economic issues. Uh, uh, I, I won't uh, spend much time on, on the historic background because the two of you uh, have given some elements. I'd like, however, to emphasize on two questions. Uh, or first of all, 
uh, when we are talking, I mean, about systems of, of repression in the Middle East and North Africa region, uh, the, the question of economic and social rights, as well as corruption, is at the center of this repressive systems. And there is a huge, I mean, overlap between uh, corruption and repressive systems, because corruption has been fueling repressive systems, repressive systems uh, and uh, the ruling uh, parties or even ruling families, because we, we, we can talk in the region about monar uh, monarchical republics where uh, sons succeed their fathers. So this ruling families or the ruling parties have been using corruption uh, and uh, their monopoly over parts of the economy to consolidate uh, their, their power. So this, this is really central to the repressive systems in place. And, and I don't think that any transitional justice uh, program or plans for these countries can, can ignore this, this aspect. Uh, the, on uh, the question of, of participation, I also believe it's very central uh, to, to what we are talking about in the region. Because again, also when we talk about these repressive systems uh, that were in place across the region, in Tunisia, in Egypt, uh, in, in, in Syria and, and in, in Yemen, uh, uh, again, I mean, the, the question of, of exclusion of uh, the, the inland regions, I mean, uh, and the centralization of power was also key, uh, was at the heart of these repressive systems, because everything was being decided in, in the capitals, and uh, <clears throat> the regions, the inland regions outside the capital were either marginalized as, as a result of this, the ultra-centralization of power which these countries has inherited from the colonizers, uh, including the, the French in North Africa. <clears throat> but also, in many countries, we have seen economic marginalization being used as a tool of repression. Uh, for instance, in Tunisia, entire regions, uh, like the, the mining valley uh, uh, in uh, uh, the, the, the north-eastern uh, part of the country, was uh, deliberately marginalized by the, the government because it was a region that has witnessed uh, uh, riots, anti-poverty movements, and so on. And, and the result was a deliberate uh, marginalization of, of these regions of the country. We have seen the exact same in, in Morocco in the 70s and, and 80s, where re entire regions were deprived from uh, development, were deprived from uh, infrastructure, were deprived from uh, 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 social and, 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 and economic uh, assistance as also a form of, of repression. Uh, the same in, in Syria, I'm not going to, to go into details, but a city like uh, Aleppo, which is unfortunately witnessing this day's uh, uh, a bloody tragedy, was also uh, targeted specifically by the, the, the regime because it was seen as uh, a, a place where uh, the Sunni community was very strong and, and it was seen as a, as a threat for uh, the Alawite uh, uh, power, the Alawite government uh, in, in Damascus. So, so what I want here to, to insist on is that, first of all, we are not only talking about violations of economic and uh, of political and civil rights, but also that violations of social and economic rights, as well as uh, corruption, 
uh, has been central. And, and if we, to, to the uprising in the region, if we go back to some of the, 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 the slogans we have seen uh, during the, the revolution, for example, in, in Tunisia, the, the main slogan was jobs, freedom, human dignity. In Egypt, it was bread, freedom, human dignity. So this is to show how important, I mean, the, the social economic aspect was, uh, but also how much the, the, the question of exclusion, lack of participation, uh, lack of, of a functioning democratic system where every citizen would be able uh, to participate were, uh, were, were, were important. So, th therefore, I mean, any transitional justice process that would be put in place in any of these countries cannot ignore uh, this, uh, this, this aspect. However, I mean, uh, when it comes really to uh, putting in place transitional justice programs for, for, for these countries, Unfortunately, I mean, with the exception of, of Tunisia, and, and I'm going to give some more uh, details of what's going on there, uh, and as uh, Hugo has suggested in, in his presentation, uh, we are seeing uh, a sort of top-down approach, and the top-down approach also includes the involvement of international actors. Uh, we are witnessing a sort of sliding of decision making in the field of transitional justice from international, uh, from local and national actors to the international levels. Uh, if we go back to what happened in Yemen, for example, where the transitional justice draft law that is being now debated, however, I mean, things Fortunately, in, in Yemen, have evolved in, uh, in uh, another direction because, I mean, the, the government in place and the, the Minister uh, for, for Legal Affairs has indeed submitted this uh, draft to a public consultation, which remained limited, but I think this was a very positive step. But it, also in, 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 in Libya, I mean, <clears throat> there is a transitional justice law adopted um, uh, earlier uh, this, this year, which also was adopted with zero consultation of the population. And my understanding is that this law was ready even before the regime uh, fell in, uh, in, in Libya and without even knowing how uh, the transition will look like, what will be the, the balance of, of power and, 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 and so on. So, uh, and, and the law was adopted but, uh, and was passed and it's being right now implemented but the general feeling is that people don't feel any sort of local ownership for, 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 for this law that was drafted by a number of international actors with some people in uh, the, the uh, transitional, uh, within the transitional authorities. So again, I mean, uh, this has been particularly uh, uh, problematic because it is perpetuating the exclusion and uh, the, the methods used in the past of, I mean, adopting things at the top and imposing it to uh, the, the, the population. In, uh, in Tunisia, however, I think that uh, the, the, the trend is different. Uh, fortunately, a national dialogue on transitional justice has been launched, and, and more importantly, it does include uh, uh, national dialogue sessions in the region outside the capital, including the regions that have suffered the most from past repression. Uh, and fortunately, I don't have enough time to go into details about this, this process. But I hope that 
Tunisia will serve as a model for the rest of the region uh, in terms of including uh, the different components of the society in a dialogue that would design uh, the transition and justice plan for the country. And, 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 and finally, uh, bef before perhaps uh, giving a few elements on, on how to deal with social and economic rights, uh, I would like to, to say, I mean, to say a few words about Syria, where unfortunately, I mean, uh, we have seen, of course, a lot of, of excitement from the international community about designing plan, plans for the transition, which, I mean, this enthusiasm is very good and, and is welcomed by, 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 the Syrian, by, by the Syrians, but what we also are seeing are transition and justice plans for, for Syria uh, that are, are really comprehensive, very detailed, and so on, when we, we don't know at all how the transition will look like. But also, and, 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 and this is very problematic, uh, Syria is a very divided society. And if there is a perception that the plans are now being uh, uh, drafted and, and prepared, I mean, uh, without even waiting for, for the transition, this will definitely be perceived as victor's justice. Uh, and, and, and this is particularly problematic. And we have seen some of this in Iraq. And, but unfortunately, I don't have time to go into, into details about Iraq. But finally, I mean, in terms of dealing with economic and social uh, issues, you know, as, as Hugo pointed out, uh, the field so far hasn't really uh, dealt with this question uh, and, and there are very few um, models. I mean, we, we could think of Timor-Leste, we could think of some other uh, examples. Uh, there are some attempts in Kenya and so on, but there is very uh, little precedent here, very few precedents from which, I mean, the, the uh, populations in, uh, in the Middle East and North Africa region uh, can, can draw lessons. So, so they will have here to, to, to innovate and, and it won't be an easy task. I mean, when it comes to a country like Tunisia, probably the fact that they are dealing with a legacy uh, of, uh, I wouldn't say minors violation, no, they are dealing with torture, they are dealing with widespread arbitrary detention and, and so on, but they are not dealing with uh, the scale of violations that uh, one could see in uh, Syria or, or, or in Yemen. So specifically in this case, I mean, I heard the Tunisians say, oh, we can afford the luxury of dealing with violations of social and, and, and economic rights because uh, we, the, the, the legacy we are dealing with is not of the scale of the legacy the, the Syrians will have to deal with or, or the Yemenis are dealing with. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I'm, I'm really convinced about this specific uh, uh, example. Uh, because at the end, as I said, I mean, it's very difficult to uh, distinguish, I mean, the economic uh, and, and social aspects of, of, of the repressive system or uh, of, 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 of a conflict from, from all uh, the other political and, and, and civil uh, aspects. But what I can say is that the field when it comes to social and economic rights is really very embryonic. Uh, the, these countries in the region will have to innovate. Tunisia has been taking a number of preparatory measures to deal with this, uh, these questions. Uh, a commission has been, was put in place last year to investigate uh, corruption. Uh, a number, uh, the, the national dialogue that I mentioned earlier is presenting dealing with economic and social questions as part of transitional justice, which I think is, is a very positive thing. But the challenge will be for them precisely how to translate, I mean, uh, 
uh, this willingness to address social and, and economic rights into concrete mechanisms. Uh, and, 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 and here, I mean, it, we will have a challenge, I mean, not only uh, to uh, divide these this, uh, um, mechanisms, but uh, also, I mean, to keep some sort of uh, a balance, I mean, between uh, addressing economic and, and social rights on the one hand and addressing civil and, and political rights on, 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 on the other hand, because one of the criticisms, I mean, of uh, addressing uh, economic and social rights through transitional justice is precisely diverting the attention from uh, violations, very serious violations, such as torture, such as, uh, in certain cases, crimes against humanity, uh, war crimes, diverting the attention from this towards uh, corruption and creating a, sort of a lack of, 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 of balance. Uh, when, I mean, corruption is supposed to be dealt through other uh, processes and other mechanisms. I will conclude by, by saying here that at the end of the day, I mean, uh, if transition and justice will not be able, I mean, to address uh, every uh, violation of the past, including economic and, 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 and social rights violation, at least, I think it would be very important for uh, the countries, the societies transitioning in the MENA region uh, to, to make sure that the different processes in place during the transition, transition and justice, development, uh, addressing unemployment and so on, are connected, interconnected, or linked to each other to avoid really uh, clashes and, 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 and contradictions between each process. We're going to move straight now to Mark Kirsten, who's going to speak to us about Libya and the International Criminal Court. Thanks, thanks for having me, yeah. Um, it's been a really interesting discussion so far. And um, what I'd like to do, at least, is to focus my uh, 12 15 minutes or whatnot um, to talk about post-conflict justice in Libya in particular. Um, and my focus is primarily on the International Criminal Court because unlike what we see in, in other Arab Spring states and other Arab Spring contexts, is that in Libya obviously the International Criminal Court played a major role and has had significant impacts on what some people might call transitional justice uh, in, in the country. Um, and just to give a little bit of background, the ICC became involved in Libya in March 2011 after, uh, sorry, in February 2011 after the United Nations Security Council referred the situation in Libya to, um, to the International Criminal Court and in March uh, very quickly it opened an, invest an official investigation and by June it had issued three arrest warrants, one for uh, Muammar Gaddafi, one for his son Saif Gaddafi, and one for his spy chief or intelligence chief, Abdul al -Samusi. And this happened remarkably quickly and I think caught a lot of people off guard. Nobody had really anticipated that the ICC would intervene um, in an Arab world state. Um, and it certainly was also unexpected that the United Nations Security Council would give a referral to the International Criminal Court. I don't think many people thought it was going to, either of those two things were going to happen for various reasons. Um, of course, it's probably too early to make any rigid conclusions, but I think what we can see, and what I can argue at least, is that the experience of post-Gaddafi, post-conflict accountability in Libya, insofar as the ICC has been involved, has been characterized by heightened antagonism between the court uh, and, and the Libyan government, Libyan officials, um, poor decision making, and, uh, and as a result of that, a failure to identify common ground. And I think the result of this has been that neither the interests of Libya nor the interests of the ICC will be satisfied or met. And I, in fact, I think they're probably, at least for the time being, likely to suffer. Um, now, as I'm sure many people know and many listeners will know, 
the pursuit of post-conflict justice, again, insofar as the ICC is involved, has focused almost entirely since Muammar Gaddafi's death on where Saif and Sanusi would be tried and by whom. Um, there's been a rather dramatic and drawn-out battle between Libya on the one hand and the ICC and many of its supporters, at least some members of the ICC and their supporters, um, about where they should be tried. Libya is saying they must be tried in in Libya, while the International Criminal Court, uh, at least some of its members again, and, and human rights groups are saying they must be transferred, surrendered to the, to the International Criminal Court and, and tried in The Hague. So I want to focus on three issues in particular. One is Libya's admissibility challenge at the ICC. The second is the detention of International Criminal Court defense staff that occurred this past summer. And then thirdly, um, to highlight some of the missed opportunities uh, that, that, that could have been highlighted and explored that would have allowed the International Criminal Court and Libya to work together rather than to, 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 to have what, what, what's happened now, which is a very acrimonious and, and rather, rather dramatic and bitter fight. So firstly, the admissibility challenge. As I've just said, Libyan officials basically, since the, since the very early um, since the very early months of the revolution said that Saif and Sanusi, no matter what, would be tried and prosecuted in Libya by Libyan judges and that no other agreement was acceptable to them. And of course, this is complicated by the fact that the International Criminal Court has had issued arrest warrants for both of those individuals. And so as a result, Libya actually took the legal steps to issue an admissibility challenge at the International Criminal Court. And what it claimed was that because it was willing and able and actively investigating both Saif and Sanusi, the courts had an obligation to allow Libya to try them. And of course, this all hinges on the court's principle of complementarity, whereby the ICC can only investigate and prosecute individuals uh, where the state is unable and unwilling to do so itself. Now, the judges have yet to rule on whether Libya can, uh, can investigate these individuals themselves or whether uh, they have an obligation to surrender them to the court. But I wanted to highlight quickly uh, the positions of some of the main actors involved. Of course, Libya, once again, has said that it needs these individuals and wants these individuals tried domestically and that it's a matter of respecting its sovereignty and, and to a certain degree a matter of, of national pride or whatnot. And I think this is completely understandable. Libya is emerging as a transitional state, doesn't want its sovereignty undermined, doesn't think that whatever happened with the judiciary under Gaddafi regime should implicate its willingness to have a functioning judiciary now. The Office of the uh, Prosecutor, uh, that was formerly led by Luis Moreno Ocampo, the chief prosecutor at the ICC, decided um, shortly after Gaddafi's death that it would side with Libya's request. And this is actually unprecedented. I don't think we've ever actually seen a case where the chief prosecutor of the ICC sides with the state and says, you know, I'm not going to compete for the case. Um, and that's, that's incredibly, I think, to a certain extent, incredibly, that's a direct quote from Luis Moreno Campo from January. I'm not going to compete with the case. And we can speculate why this might be. I think there's, it's probably a combination of two issues. I think the Office of the Prosecutor understands that there's no way that they will ever, or they believe that they would never actually get custody of either Saif and Sanusi. And so to be seen to contribute and to allow Libya to pursue this justice may be um, maybe a second best option or what or whatnot. And then secondly, uh, some have argued that actually the, I, the Office of the Prosecutor doesn't have a particularly good case um, in particular for Saeed and that if Saeed would be transferred to the ICC to face trial, there is at least some some chance and probably a good chance, Jeffrey Robertson, for example, has, 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 has argued this, that um, that, that he could get um, acquitted or uh, that he would be found not guilty. Um, then you have the defense staff at the ICC, um, and the defense staff are representing Saif, and they've argued that Libya doesn't have a functioning judicial system that is capable of genuinely, fairly, and impartially um, 
in investigating and putting on trial and prosecuting both Saif and Sanusi. And, um, and that if tried, and they've argued this numerous times, that if these people were actually tried in, in Libya, they would simply receive the death penalty. Then thirdly, you have the international community, broadly speaking, but in particular I'm looking at the U United Nations Security Council, which has basically been nowhere to be found. They, they've said a few times here and there that they'd like um, Libya to cooperate with the International Criminal Court, but they've lent virtually no support to the ICC mandate following the, the referral. For a few months it seemed like they were supporting it, um, and I can go into if it's of interest to anyone, why why they basically stopped um, supporting the international criminal court mandate and work in Libya, but they certainly did so and have remained silent on on uh, basically throughout the entire process. Um, certainly since Gaddafi's death. So now I'll move on to um, the the detention of st of ICC staff in Libya. Um, and this may not be surprising, if you look at this constellation of actors and their political interests that I've just tried to outline, it, I don't think it's surprising that tensions would generally increase and that bitterness between the parties would increase, and it certainly did. Um, yet I don't think, again, anyone could have foreseen what happened this summer, which was that in early June, four ICC uh, defense staff reportedly representing Saif Gaddafi were arrested in Zintan, where Saif has been held ever since his capture in November 2011. And they were basically told by the local militia that they had been arrested uh, for spying. Um, and this came despite the fact, and the widely acknowledged the fact, that the staff, as, as staff of the International Criminal Court, working for the International Criminal Court when they were arrested, enjoyed diplomatic immunity. Um, and it became clear very, very quickly that that um, that their arrests were politically motivated. There were statements by members of, the, of Libya's National Transitional Council, which basically said, look, we want information that these defense staff ha about, uh, uh, sorry, have about someone in Egypt that we want. Um, and if they give us that information, we're happy to release them. And later on, it, it, it emerged that, um, that, that these staff members had been arrested as a result of retaliation for things that they, these staff members and the Defense Council had said about Libya's judiciary. So it's quite a um, politicized situation. And of course, there has been no evidence um, given that they were actually spying. Uh, again, the international community, virtually completely silent. It took them a number of days before they even, uh, before the UN Security Council even said anything about the, the arrested staff. And when they did, it was a very short, um, short paragraph saying that the staff should be released. And interestingly enough, of all people, the, the statement was actually uh, put forward and pushed forward by, by uh, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. So it wasn't actually supported or, or pushed through by, by any of the permanent five members of the Security Council who are members of the International Criminal Court, namely Britain and the UK. At the same time, we had Ambassador Bob Carr of Australia getting very much involved. One of the main lawyers who had been detained uh, was Melinda Carr, who was an Australian, and so he, Bob Carr became very involved. And he quickly began to criticize the International Criminal Court's protocols and guidelines on, on individuals working uh, in these types of contexts. And he suggested publicly, um, about two weeks or so after their initial detention, that the International Criminal Court should actually apologize to the Libyan government and that if they did, um, this debacle would be over. Um, a number of observers um, criticized the idea that the ICC should do this, but regardless, the ICC, I think, was put in an incredibly difficult position. If it apologized, then there was a chance that the ICC staff would be released. But of course, apologizing for something that is not its fault comes with significant risks. Uh, on the other hand, if it didn't apologize, and this was in the public sphere that if it did, the staff would be released, well then, it would appear to be contributing to their prolonged retention. So, they did issue a statement of regret and later basically a full apology. Um, and after 26 days in detention, the ICC staff were, were released and sent back to life. 
Now, in my view, at least, Libya's reputation has been severely damaged as a result, and certainly in, in the transitional justice and, and human rights community. Um, and perhaps more importantly to, to Libya and certainly the, its government, um, it's, this is likely to weaken its admissibility challenge. I don't see how judges would be particularly eager to accept Libya's uh, admissibility challenge after this happens, given that uh, if they accepted it, it could be seen as an implicit acceptance or even approval that what had happened this past summer with the detention of these staff was in any way okay. For the ICC, I think actually the implications could be worse. Um, it could, this apology could, have, could set a precedent where any state who finds ICC staff a nuisance that's investigating in the country, uh, you can simply arrest them and then wait for the court to apologize. The question of diplomatic immunity uh, clearly wasn't particularly relevant in this case, and I think that's um, a rather scary um, possible precedent for the court. Um, and of course, this, as a result, could have serious implications on the possibility of court staff to work in fragile transitional political context um, in the future. It also, I can't get into it for, for time reasons, but it also, it also exposed rather acrimonious and bitter divisions within the International Criminal Court itself, and in particular between the defense and the office of the prosecutor. And these clearly have to be addressed, and this, these, these divisions need to be healed, um, I think, if the court is to remain effective. However, I'm not sure what is happening in order to achieve that. Thirdly, I'd like to talk briefly about missed opportunities, and I promise I'll be quick. Um, but, but basically, it didn't have to go down this way. It's, we didn't have to end up in this situation where there's so much bitterness, so much, um, you know, breaking of the law, international law and domestic law, so much misunderstanding, etc. Um, as I suggested, as, it's, well, as I hope I've suggested so far, is that post Gaddafi, Libya has been justice in Libya has been framed very black and white. It's either the Hague or Libya. But, um, but two options could have been pursued and examined um, and elaborated to the public in particular um, that could have prevented uh, us from being in this uh, scenario now. And the two situations that I think um, that some people have highlighted and I highlighted in some of my work and which are both possible under the Rome Statute are firstly uh, having in, an in situ trial in Libya, so that if the International Criminal Court judges actually went to Libya and sat in, for example, Tripoli and heard cases and cooperated with Libyan prosecutors and whatnot and had some kind of justice sharing arrangement. And then secondly, to have, um, to have a sequencing of trials. So, for example, first Libya would try Saif and Sanusi domestically and then they would be transferred to The Hague. And I think this, in particular, could be useful because Libyans, um, especially in the case of Abdullah al Sanusi, are looking to prosecute him not for crimes that occurred during the revolution or even when the court has jurisdiction, but for crimes that happened before February 15, 2011, in his case, namely the Abu Salim um, massacre of 1996. Of course, and unfortunately, uh, these these two options weren't weren't explored or elaborated. I think they could have been. There seems to be some hope that maybe they could be revised, but I'm not sure what level of political will exists in order to do so. And of course, neither of them, neither of these two options are are perfect. But I think they would have met the interests of both the ICC and Libya. The International Criminal Court would have looked like it was an effective institution contributing to post conflict justice in Libya on the one hand, and Libya would have retained its desired sense of sovereignty and would likely have actually been praised in the international community for being for exploring these, these creative and unique options, um, not to mention praised by international rights groups. So uh, in conclusion, we actually had admissibility hearings this past last week, sorry, last week in The Hague between Libya um, and, uh, and, and, and members of the defense staff where all the positions were basically revealed again. And the level of animosity was absolutely remarkable with snide comments, temper tantrums apparently perhaps behind the scenes, and, um, and, and certainly some, some laughter uh, 
it, it's remarkable, at least to what extent this was visible during during the proceedings um, themselves. This level of bitterness between the parties. Of course, it remains to be seen how the judges will will actually rule on the subject, um, and we can speculate on that. I'm not sure. I have my own feelings about it, but we'll we'll see what we, what exactly will happen. Again, ideally, would be if they could find middle ground, uh, but I'm not sure they haven't. Uh, if, the, if the individuals on either side really have an interest in doing so. Um, but again, Libya clearly wants to be seen as a respected member and a, and a sovereign member of the international community, while the ICC wants to be seen as an effective institution, one that contributes positively, I think, to post-conflict justice. And, um, but without finding any sort of middle grounds um, where the interests of both can be satisfied in effect. It seems clear to me that neither are ultimately uh, likely to see see their interests met, um, and, and I'll end it there. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you very much. We're going to move now to Michael Hanna, again, who's the Fellow and Program Officer at Century Foundation. Um, I think I'll start out for the very general observation, and I think it's it's important to note at this historical juncture that there is a push in many of these societies for post-conflict transitional justice um, and there is in many of these countries a domestic constituency uh, pushing for accountability. Um, I think um, we should uh, in many ways set aside a notion that these are international norms or conventions um, and look in, at the ways in which domestic and local actors have adopted uh, these notions from the start. Now, modalities of how you apply such concepts is all over the map. You see different constituencies uh, and, and different angles with respect to how people want to see post-conflict justice vindicated. Um, but from the start in, in these societies, and particularly when, I, and I, and when I'm thinking about this, this uh, typology, I think Egypt, Libya, and Tunisia uh, because they are the ones that have had the cleanest uh, breaks, um, offer the most interesting example here. And in each of these societies, um, prior to the transitions, during the uprising uh, and post, uh, post fall of the regime, we have seen various types of domestic movements pushing for uh, a certain degree of accountability. Uh, I think if I turn to Egypt, um, I think it's important for me, from my analysis and work, um, transitional justice, I think, has been a very interesting barometer for the health of Egypt's transition. Um, and in many ways, it has told us um, a not such a great story. Um, I think um, to go sort of to the political side of transition, um, Egypt's transition had a moment, uh, an opening for really transformational change uh, immediately after the fall of Mubarak. Uh, particularly in February, March, April of 2011, um, a lot of that initial promise has been squandered. Uh, and frankly, um, I've argued for m uh, many months now that uh, Egypt is no longer in position for uh, far-reaching revolutionary change. Um, we look, uh, the, the situation is much more akin to uh, something like a reform movement. Um, and the hopes people had for transitional justice um, uh, have shifted as, as this uh, transition has played out. Um, and unfortunately, uh, I think the prosecution of Hosni Mubarak has sucked up a lot of the attention. As much as it was a core demand for the protest movement, um, it has been used tactically uh, as a tool to blunt protest. Uh, there was a cycle uh, early on when the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces was still in direct control of the country. Um, when, when the council and the military was interested in staunching the protest movement uh, and perhaps pushing back against the momentum for change. Uh, and the prosecution of Mubarak was a card in this, uh, in, in this broader struggle. Um, and unfortunately, it's overshadowed many of the other uh, efforts to try to look toward perhaps a more broad-based uh, transitional justice model. Uh, and of course, uh, what we haven't seen uh, is a, uh, an approach that uh, reaches beyond simply the 18 days. 
uh, that looks more systematically uh, at the legacy of authoritarian rule uh, and systematic abuse. Um, that still is not on the table, uh, and I think that's unfortunate. Um, and uh, uh, transitional justice efforts have been tightly focused on the 18 days of protest. Um, and, and of course, even there, we've seen very little by way of accountability. Um, if we look at the nature of the verdicts from the Mubarak trial, um, what we have essentially uh, is an incoherent legal uh, uh, judgment, uh, whereby uh, Mubarak and Habib al-Adli, his last minister of the interior, uh, were found to be negligent, essentially, of, uh, sorry, found uh, guilty of negligence, uh, not necessarily of giving orders, uh, and yet no one has been held accountable for actually uh, giving the orders uh, to kill protests. So it's, it's something of an incoherent final result uh, of, that Mubarak, uh, of the Mubarak trial. Um, and I think what that trial indicates is that uh, these transitional justice efforts, particularly the prosecutorial efforts, um, have tracked very closely the trajectory of the transition. I think none of these outcomes uh, was foreordained, so to speak, um, and uh, would have looked quite different if the political situation in the country uh, was more settled uh, and there was a greater, frankly, consensus behind uh, these core goals. And I think that has been uh, uh, lacking uh, to a great degree. Uh, if we look at the patterns of accountability in Egypt, um, the only consistent pattern of accountability has been for those cases of uh, corruption. Uh, obviously, this is an important facet of uh, regime repression uh, and uh, the maintenance of regime survival. And we heard earlier from Habib Nassar about um, its place within, uh, uh, within the sort of infrastructure that supports uh, authoritarian regimes. Um, of course, as with uh, my previous comments about the, the broader trajectory of transitional justice, again, I think this is primarily a reflection of the politics uh, and the political status quo that has pertained since the fall of Mubarak. Uh, these corruption trials have uh, 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 focused quite narrowly and tightly uh, on, the, uh, on Gamal Mubarak, the president's son who had been groomed for succession, um, and the regime insiders that had grown up around him. Uh, and that's no accident because um, if we look at the political score settling that went on after the fall of Mubarak, these goals were firmly in line with the vision of the Egyptian military, uh, and uh, this was a uh, easy way to settle scores uh, and to uh, 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 and to push forward a narrative about what was wrong with the country on the eve of the uprising, without pushing too far in the direction. Uh, of looking uh, at the broader issues of authoritarian oppression uh, that had pertained in Egypt since uh, Abdel Nasser and his uh, and the 1952 revolution or coup, depending on how you want to characterize those um, events. Uh, and so these corruption trials have, have essentially been the only consistent form of accountability. Um, when we look beyond prosecutorial strategies, um, we see also, I think, a lot of missed opportunities, um, and uh, we've seen very little in, by way of security sector reform. Uh, there's been very little vetting at the Ministry of Interior, say, uh, and broader notions of uh, perhaps uh, historical commissions or truth and reconciliation bodies um, have not made their way into popular discourse. Uh, and at the moment, with when there is so much focus on uh, the ills of the transition uh, uh, with economic matters, uh, when so much of the transition is unsettled, when Egyptian society is quite polarized. Uh, if we look at the presidential election, um, Hosni Mubarak's uh, last prime minister, Ahmed Shafi, narrowly lost. Uh, he lost uh, while still uh, pushing forward an old regime narrative about the uprising, about the former regime, um, a narrative that, that, uh, that held uh, much of the former regime blameless uh, for repression. Uh, and so you see now in this protracted, messy uh, transition, I think, an ebbing away of much of the momentum uh, that, that was there uh, behind uh, perhaps pushing forward a broad um, a broad agenda of transitional justice. Now, 
there still is, I think, a uh, consensus among some pockets, among reformists and others, uh, that there is uh, uh, of the need for uh, accountability. Um, there was a uh, report that came out over the weekend by the Nadim Center for Human Rights. Um, and you know, if we look at what, what animated protesters in the past, uh, you, we see that many of these uh, abuses are still live issues in uh, the Egyptian body politic. Uh, the numbers that were released suggested that there had been um, 88 tortured uh, and 34 killed by the Egyptian authorities uh, in just the 100 days of President Mohamed Morsi's uh, uh, rule. Um, now, if these numbers are verified, I think uh, they are quite shocking uh, and tell uh, a very important tale about how little reform has taken place in the security sector. Um, and for that reason, we still see persistent calls for, despite this uh, polarized political community, uh, consistent calls for um, uh, for accountability uh, and particularly a focus on uh, security sector reform. Uh, and for that reason, I think that will continue uh, into uh, into the future. Um, but I, you know, going back to these divisions in Egyptian society, um, I think if we think about the potential for broader based uh, national reconciliation, um, I think that's going to be impossible without a real grappling with history. And I, and I mean um, not just the 18 days, uh, but, a, but a broader telling about what has happened in Egypt and how Egypt ended up where uh, it has. Uh, and I think we've seen all sorts of counter narratives, uh, particularly focused on the 18 days, about Hamas's involvement or uh, more outlandish notions that the Muslim Brotherhood was in fact uh, uh, part of uh, part of the reason and the impetus behind the killing of protesters. Um, and surprisingly, some of these counter narratives have traction with segments of the population. Um, and I think this polarization is. Uh, quite problematic uh, to the future of a sustainable uh, democracy and a sustainable political process. Um, what we've seen continually is a political process that responds only to crisis. Uh, and I think um, at some point in the near future, it would behoove the authorities uh, to think more methodically about transitional justice processes. We heard about Tunisia. and despite the more recent uh, stumbles of the transitional government in Tunisia, um, their, their, uh, their transition has been much more methodical, including on issues of transitional justice. Um, it's true that uh, the Tunisians have largely eschewed the possibility of prosecutions as a key modality for vindicating the goals of transitional justice. Um, and it's unclear, frankly, what is going to happen in Tunis. But there's clearly much more systematic and coherent thought that is going into transitional justice in Tunisia uh, than it has in Egypt. Um, and, I, and I think um, we're, Egypt is, at a, is in, a, in, a, in a dire need um, for uh, sitting down, trying to institute a national dialogue. Uh, and of course, um, on the issue of transitional justice, this is symptomatic of the broader failures of Egypt's transition. Um, the need for national dialogue and consensus is not only with respect to transitional justice, uh, but really about the way forward for uh, Egypt as a country uh, and the refashioning, the absolutely need, re necessary refashioning uh, of a more equitable social compact. Um, Very interesting insights there from Michael Hanna. And we're going to end here with Alham, Alham I'm sorry, Mania, uh, who's joining us from Zurich. Um, without going into much, basically, to, uh, in, in order for us not to, uh, to waste much time, as you see, when it comes to the structure, um, I put uh, three kind of um, points. I will make a quick introduction by using an example of a current campaign by some women activists on Facebook. And then I will go to three observations. Um, when I'm talking basically about uh, transitional justice in terms of or from the perspective of inclusive citizenship. And then based on the, these three uh, observations, I'll come to the consequences. Now, if you look here, you see this 
uh, new phase book campaign entitled The Uprising of Women in the Arab World in the Mar'a in the Arab World its aim, as you see here, is together for this free and independent women in the Arab world. It has, that's not really a huge number, 40,000 uh, something like. Nevertheless, what I found very interesting is the fact that the enthusiasm by which posts were basically put on that Facebook by both Arab young men and women from the whole region. Now, let me put, show you some of these quotes. Marwa from Yemen, what is she saying? I'm with the uprising of women in the Arab world because it is my right to get an identity card and passport without the permission of my guardian. In that, she is referring um, to the fact that many of the discrimination that is taking place within the region are actually ingrained in laws. So we're talking about systematic discrimination uh, sanctioned by the state itself. Second one, Anwar from Yemen. What is he saying? He's saying, with the uprising of Arab women, because it is written on my sister's grave, the wife of someone. Here, we're talking about uh, traditional norms that are more or less uh, um, predominant within the Arabian Peninsula, which consider a woman uh, more or less a kind of like the mentioning of her name is a kind of a shame. So he is with the uprising of Arab women because of that. If we go to another country which is totally different from Yemen, and that is Tunisia, you see here what, what Hala and Hela are saying. We are with the uprising of women in the Arab world because we deeply believe in differences, but we will never accept and understand discrimination. In other words, they are referring to a certain kind of religious narration that is being dominant lately, which more or less insists that men and women are different and they're, um, uh, physically, and therefore their rights should be also different. They shouldn't enjoy the same life. Amina, or Amin from Tunisia, he is saying, I'm with your uprising because you are Arab, because freedom began with you. From the heart of you were born the free ones and freed the revolutionaries. Revolt and rise. I am with you for you, O mother of freedom. This brings me to the issue of the Arab uh, freedom revolt. I prefer to use the Freedom Revolt than the Arab Spring because it seems um, if we are using a spring right now, we could basically think about um, autumn coming and then winter. So maybe the Arab Freedom Revolt will more or less reflect the transformation that is taking place without making a judgment about it. Women were active participants in the protests in Tunisia, Egypt, Yemen, Libya, and Bahrain. Uh, they more or less they were uh, they stood side by side with men, uh, with uh, um, with uh, with uh, um, um, they were united in calling for freedom uh, and regime change. However, with the removal of some Arab autocrats, all barriers and discrimination went up. You have here women were harassed, beaten, chased out of public spaces. Only um, nine women were uh, elected to the Egyptian parliament. That is uh, not more than 1%. And the exception is Tunisia, as usual, 25% of the constituent assembly. Essentially, although I will basically qualify that because afterwards, because uh, just the majority, they are coming uh, from al, al Mahda um, party. And it seems that they have a different kind of like perception sometimes when it comes to women rights. I'll make three observations about these processes that are taking place right now. It's too early to make any judgment, specifically when it comes to the uh, future uh, of women and the, the inclusive, the issue of inclusive citizenship. But the first observation, very simply, that 
Historically, women have often played an integral role in independence movements and struggles against occupation, and in the process have defined social stereotypes and constraints of their traditional roles in society. However, the moment the situation started to normalize, the old social norms and traditional perceptions of women's roles have tended to reassert themselves. If I give you some examples, the, third, the most famous one is the 1919 Egyptian Revolution. There, in 1923, basically, it was like women expected after their participation, their active participation in the Egyptian Revolution, that they will be granted um, uh, uh, voting rights, but that was not the case. The time was not right for that, as the argument was. You look to Iraqi occupation of Kuwait 1990 and 1991. Also, despite their active role against the occupation, um, Kuwaiti women did not receive their suffrage rights in 2005. And here, um, Fatima al Abdabi, you could read afterwards what she was saying, but she basically she said, we expected that we would gain our rights immediately after the liberation in 1991. This did not happen. But when they realized that this would not happen, it was the moment at the end of her statement that made us decide to engage in the political struggle to gain our rights. I will come back to this point afterwards because it uh, rem uh, reminds us of what was said at the beginning about the importance of uh, participation from society itself. Second observation, the overthrow of heads of states does not necessarily mean an end to their regimes nor to their established pattern of politics towards women's rights. In fact, we are, as I said, it's like if, uh, we, when we talk about, uh, when we talk afterwards in the discussion, we could go into details about the differences between all these systems and how is this reflecting on the transformation uh, that is taking place within these contexts and the transitional justice. However, if it concerns women's rights, again, we, we see a certain pattern. It's important, first of all, to mention, right, yeah. if you look to Arab state and women's rights, you see a certain, first of all, female suffrage rights have been often granted automatically with the establishment of the post-colonial Arab state. Because you have Syria as the first, 1949. Or when the state deemed society ready for that step or was pressured to do so, uh, Kuwait is one of uh, uh, the examples of countries who were more or less um, pressured to a certain extent to do so. Majority of Arab states were reluctant to modernize their family laws. So you have, on the one hand, on the public sphere, you have the possibility for women to participate in the, in the political uh, uh, arena. However, if you look at the private lives, and here we're talking about family laws, family laws are derived from religious provisions, and we're talking about legal pluralism, where each religious community has its own family law. In general, these uh, laws bestow on women an unequal status within the family. They restrict women's ability to marry, move, work, or travel, freely without the consent of their male relatives or husband. This brings us to the issue. I, told, I was saying we're talking about a certain pattern of politics, and I'm not really convinced that this pattern of politics will change with this transformation. The Arab state is neither liberal nor patriarchal. In fact, it is very opportunistic, always acting in a Machiavellian manner. So if it made then politically, the state would act in favor of women's emancipation, but if it didn't, it would not. Arab ruling elites have been constantly engaged in the politics of survivor, and that is undertaking whatever it takes to remain in power. This has shaped its gender politics sometimes to the better, and most of the times to the worse. If you look closely to the political context, within which this politics of survivor is taking place, it, they're, not, they're not working in void. Here you have Arab states in their formulation of position, 
towards gender issues are not acting in a vacuum. They take into consideration different and sometimes contradictory interests of social groups that are important for the survivor. You have, in addition to them, opposition groups, nationalists, leftists, secular, liberal, who engage in the political process. They, too, have been opportunistic in their conduct of politics. They always take into account the their conservative constituency. You have Islamist groups which had a principled position towards gender issue. They often stood, you, you, you just have to look at their voting patterns in the parliaments previously and now. They stood firm against the demands of women's movements for changes in laws and policies that marginalize women. And then finally, you have women groups who have entered the political field since the opening up of the political system, what is being labeled in the literature as controlled uh, liberalization um, uh, since uh, the end of the Cold War. But their ability to shape the, uh, the political discourse and outcome today is still messy. This brings me to the third observation. The success of Islamist party in this transitional period poses serious questions about the future of women's rights. While the Islamists vary in the United States certain women's rights, they do share a conservative view on women's role in society. If we are using uh, the, 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 the cradle of uh, Islamist movement, I will use basically the work of Hassan al-Banna and his tract about the Muslim woman, it's important to see that there is always this distinction between a man and woman, as he said, in rights, but this is based on natural differences. So women are equal according to this in dignity, but not in rights. Important to mention at this, and this is very important to transitional justice that we're talking about here, that discrimination is not only limited to women, in fact, inequality of minority is the other face of the coin. And that means, if you look at the way the Islamist rights schemes, um, it's interesting to see that according to these Islamist rights schemes, it's like a right, rights, human rights, seems to be enjoyed by a Muslim, preferably Sunni if you are in, in, in Sunni countries, or Shia if you are in Iran, and he has to be male. So more or less, you have this kind of like discussion. Now this brings me to the consequences, and I'm at the end of my presentation, so please don't worry. Um, uh, the first one is democrati democratization or transformation, because up until now, I'm not really sure what's happening right now in, um, in, uh, in Yemen or uh, in Libya or even in, uh, uh, into uh, Egypt is, uh, could qualify for a process of free uh, democratization, may not necessarily lead to more gender rights or justice, not on the short run at least. The politics of survival will not cease to be at play in the new political system. In fact, it is, it continued to be at play. This you see it whether in Yemeni, who is basically um, um, allying themselves with Ali Mohsen Ahmar and Hamid Al Ahmar and his group, or you see it also within Egyptian context at how the military um, at the beginning more or less uh, cooperated and more or less made uh, alliances with the uh, Islamist um, uh, party. And then you have also many new political actors will have to weigh the costs of supporting rights that stand at odds with conservative constituencies. Because here, it's like one has basically also to take into consideration they're not working in, uh, in, in void. They are working within a context, and this context is very patriarchal in nature, very conservative in nature. And new Islamist elites are attempting to change the laws and institutions in the transitional period in a way that reflects their world view. And it's interesting to see that within this Tunisian um, uh, co uh, constituency um, uh, council, uh, those who are representing another from the women, from uh, uh, the female um, um, parliamentarians, they didn't have a problem 
with a suggestion of changing the constitution and article instead of man and woman are equal before the law, the suggestion was basically man, uh, uh, a woman is comp complementing a man, and there's a big difference between the two, but they didn't have a problem with that. Last observation, which at, at least tries to bring some kind of like uh, optimistic note here. Previous experiences and research have shown that Arab women were able to find and gain more rights when and only when they fought back. That means through coordination of their work. Uh, coordination means including also um, women across the ideological differences. Islamists, when they join, join in the uh, in the Kuwaiti uh, women campaign for uh, their rights, they mo were more effective. An effective use of the media and launching of organized campaigns for their rights. Civil and human rights are not gifts to be handed top down by the state or political actors. They have to be won through peaceful but relentless struggle. I don't see any difference here when it comes to uh, women's rights. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. All of your presentations were incredibly uh, insightful. And I have tons of questions myself, so you might get emails from me um, as I pick your brains on some of the ideas that you uh, inspired in me. Thank you very much again. And uh, thank you for everybody that tuned in online. <laughs>